begin with a picture of home. This image was taken by Voyager 1 as it was poised to leave our solar system. It was the brainchild of Carl Sagan, and his point was that amongst the vast cosmos, the place we live is but a tiny speck, the pale blue dot. But what I'm interested in is that blue, the colour of that dot, which of course is the oceans. The oceans cover 70% of our planet. Um, they supply half of the oxygen and um, half of the world's population directly depend on the oceans for their livelihood. But in fact, all of us depend on the oceans. The oceans have um, absorbed almost all of the extra heat that human activities have introduced into our climate system. Were it not for the oceans and that heat had gone into the atmosphere, we'd be 50 degrees warmer, too hot for human habitation. So the oceans have saved us from ourselves, for now. They also connect us to Antarctica, and they connect Antarctica's own ice to itself. Antarctica has two types of ice. that We have the glacial ice sitting on the land, and um, sea ice uh, formed from frozen ocean. Um, so Scott Base is strategically located, circled there in red, uh, at the intersection between these two types of ice. To the south, we have the ice shelf, the floating extension of the glacial ice, and to the north, the sea ice. And the ocean, of course, flows between both of these, making a two-way connection. So we start with the sea ice. The surface of the ocean freezes in winter to a size that basically doubles the size of Antarctica. As it does so, the salt that was in the water gets rejected uh, and drops down to the bottom of the seafloor where it can flow away. Sea ice formation can be concentrated in ice factories or polynia, the largest of which uh, is located at the front of the Ross Ice Shelf. So we have this concentration of brine being formed there, which can drop down and flow into the ice shelf cavity, where it can take heat right to the back of the cavity and start melting the ice from underneath. We're going to follow the journey of this water as it comes out again, uh, and just keep an eye on the, the map for, for reference as to where we are. So we start right at the back of the ice shelf, um, where it was assumed that because the ice shelf is pumping up and down, that the water in the cavity must be completely well mixed. Well, very recent observations have shown that this is uh, not true. There's actually some structure there. And we can see the start of that meltwater as it begins its journey on the way out. Coming to the middle of the ice shelf, again, we've got the same sort of structure. We've got this warm, deep water and the meltwater on its way out. But in the middle of the water column, now we've got some complexity. Where has that complexity come from? And what are its implications for the evolution of the ice? These are current questions. Finally, we move right out to the sea ice again, just right at the front of the ice shelf. And here we've got that melt water, all that colour in blue at the top, that represents 70 metres of water that's now super cooled. So it's below its own freezing temperature. This is water just ready and waiting for an opportunity to freeze. And that's what I study. So this is my field camp. What we do is we drag a set of um, converted sh shipping containers out onto the sea ice and set them up to make our field camp. Uh, this image was taken at three o'clock in the morning. Some of those containers have a lift out floor so that we can um, melt our way down through the ice and create a window into the ocean that can stay open for weeks at a time. Uh, it means we can keep working whatever the weather, so of course that's quite convenient for us. We're of course not the only ones that that is convenient for. <laughs> this guy was a regular visitor to our field camp. He would put his face under that flow of warm air that we had to keep the hole open and go to sleep. But this is what we're really after. These are the crystals, the ice crystals that form in that supercooled water. And they form and grow until they're big enough that they're going to float up and land against the base of the sea ice above them. Um, very beautiful, and they create a really unique layer of ice and a unique habitat. 
going down deeper and looking back up, we can see that these individual crystals sediment against the base of the sea ice in much the same way that uh, sand, crystal, sand grains would on the seafloor. And so they're creating ripples and formations. The blue light is sunlight that's been filtered through snow, sea ice, and then this platelet ice. Up close, the platelets grow through each other to create an open structure that um, allows water to flow through it and creates this unique habitat that supports algae and from there the rest of the food chain. Now this work that we're doing in Antarctica has relevance beyond our own world. So this is one of the moons of Saturn, Enceladus, which has a global ocean, and that global ocean is topped by a thick crust of ice. So this is the closest analog that New, that, um, New Zealand, the world has to um, uh, the, the ice shelves, of course, represent this analog. Here's another example, uh, Jupiter's moon, Europa, which will be the target of a NASA, NASA probe looking for life elsewhere in our solar system. So from this perspective, let's just have another look at home, thinking about all the troubles that we're facing, and I just want to finish with some words from Carl Sagan himself. There is perhaps no better demonstration of the folly of human conceits than this distant image of our tiny world. To me, it underscores our responsibility to deal more kindly with one another and to preserve and cherish the pale blue dot, the only home we've ever known. Thank you.